Ready? Good morning. Welcome to Salem Bible Church, April 19th, 2020, morning service. Uh, Remember that today we are going to celebrate communion together. So if you haven't prepared, just get yourself something to sip, water or juice, something, and a cracker or some bread. And at the end of the service, we'll be doing that together. We're going to start out with, to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that woman from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But pure and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. Pastor? Thank you, Steve. Love being able to give God the glory no matter what's going on in the world. So happy to be here with you guys once again this week. Uh, As we always do here at church, let's open up our service with a word of prayer. Lord, the scripture makes it clear we are to be in the business of giving God glory. We do it through the things that happen in our lives, the way that we watch your hand guide us, protect us. We do it when we're out in the world and we see the wonders of nature all around us. It happens when we look into the word and we see what it was that Jesus did for us on Good Friday and then the power shown on Easter Sunday. Lord, on all those occasions, we want to stop for just a moment and give God the glory. Why? Great things he has done. So, Father, especially now in a time of trouble where everyone seems to be looking for answers, it's a great reminder of where the answers are by giving you glory. The scripture gives us illustration after illustration of your powerful hand at work. Lord, those are written so that we might have hope in the time of trouble. So each time we gather together, we pray that the songs that we sing and the word that we look at will give hope to those that are watching. Each day the news seems to have a little bit more discouraging things to say. And yet because of who you are, we can have hope. So today, Lord, we give you the glory for all the things that you've done. Pray for hearts that are watching, that you'll encourage them through these songs and through the word. As always, Lord, we give this hour to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a reminder that uh, for those of you who need them, 
We have our Daily Bread, the large print editions available. We also have this book. We have, I have a couple copies of it, so I can send it out. Uh, Max Lucado, Anxious for Nothing, um, Finding Calm in a Chaotic World. Perfect for right now. Um, just let me know. Text me, email me, call me. Um, I'll get it to you, either whether dropping it off at your mailbox or mailing it to you, whatever works best. Uh, just let me know on those things. We're going to sing, We've a Story to Tell to the Nations. We've a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light, story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a song to be sung to the nations that shall lift their hearts to the Lord. A song that shall conquer evil and shatter the spear and sword, and shatter the spear and sword. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a message to give to the nations that the Lord who reigneth above has sent us his Son to save us and show us that God is love. Show us that God is love. For the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a Savior to show to the nations who the path of sorrow hath trod, that all of the world's great peoples might come to the truth of God, might come to the truth of God. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. Just another note, if you guys have favorites you want us to sing, pop it in the comments, and Jody will jot it down and get it to me so we can sing it tomorrow or next Sunday, whatever, just let us know if you have some favorites you'd like to sing. Pastor? Thanks, Steve. Just in the way of announcements, obviously, as the events of the world keep changing, we'll keep adjusting here. Last week, the governor extended the stay-at-home order until at least May 1st, so we're going to continue doing what we're doing, uh, keeping the... Uh, the service is private for just the crew that's trying to live stream this to you. But Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we'll continue with that pattern. And even if she lifts the stay at home or makes some changes to it, keep watching the website. If you're on the prayer chain, you'll get some updates. And come May 1st, we'll put our heads together and we'll evaluate what did she do? What should we do? We realize that even after this is lifted, we're going to look a little different here. Uh, probably people will be wearing masks to be safe. Uh, in fact, one of our church members made some masks and we'll have some in the back in case you come here on a Sunday and think, man, I wish I had a mask on, we'll have some. So we'll make whatever adjustments are necessary as time unfolds, but until then, we'll keep connecting with you this way. If you do have more time on your hands, this series that I've been kind of doing started on Good Friday. And then Easter Sunday morning, Easter Sunday night, this morning and tonight is kind of a five-part series designed to bring you hope, focusing on the power that God has, and we believe that through that power you might have hope. So all of those are posted. 
So I encourage you to go back to Good Friday, then Easter Sunday morning, Sunday night, today's, and then I'll finish it up tonight. We're looking at 10 little glimpses at God's power, so watch them back. Uh, and as you do, make sure you bring your Bible with so you can see and read along with me. And I think as you see these glimpses, you cannot help but have your hearts encouraged. Um, I think that's about it for me. I, Steve and I want to do something, uh, a little bit of a repeat. One of the things that I think carries us through these times of difficulty is that we have to up our relationship with God and spend more time with him each and every day. A couple of weeks back, we sang this song. It's one of my favorites. It is well with my souls at the top of the list. And right underneath it is this one day by day. But we didn't have the sound quite as well as I would have liked it. And so Steve and I are going to try it again. Uh, day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Doesn't that connect with what I talked about in the beginning where Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. And so uh, this song reminds us that even though we might have trouble, we might have trials, that each and every day, God can help us through it. So we're going to try this again. Mr. Steve, you and I, social distancing, but day by day. Stay over there. <laughs> passing moment strength I find to meet my trials here trusting in my father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear he whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best lovingly it's part of pain and pleasure mingling toil with peace and rest every day the lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour all my cares he fain would bear and cheer me, he whose name is Counselor and Power, the protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid, as your days your strength shall be in measure, this the pledge. Thanks, Steve. I want to take just a few moments and spend some time praying. Uh, if you've been with us on Wednesday night, you know that our plan every Wednesday night is pretty simple. We're going through the book of Psalms and reading some of the encouraging words that David wrote uh, during his times of trouble. And then we spend some time taking your prayer requests. And so, especially during these difficult times, um, we need to be united uh, in prayer for these these requests. What have we been praying for? Of course, we're praying for our leaders, uh, both the politicians in Washington and the politicians locally, that God will give them wisdom. The scripture tells us that we are to pray for those that are in authority. It has nothing to do whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. 
The Bible says pray for those that have to make these decisions. Uh, Trump happens to be a Republican and our governor happens to be a Democrat, but we want them to have the wisdom to make the right decisions to protect us uh, so that we can continue to enjoy the benefits of this great country and to be able to tell you about who Jesus Christ is. So be praying for your politicians and pray for them every day. Of course, the scripture tells us in the book of Job, there's a thing called the hedge of protection. And so we've been praying a hedge of protection around this church and our church family. You could be praying and should be praying the same thing for your families, that this virus cannot make its way towards you. And then locally, just praying for our church family. Uh, we have a church member here. His name is Lance Lash, and his brother Larry uh, caught this virus, and he's in intensive care. And so ask that you might pray for him. A couple of our other members uh, had a niece that was in intensive care, but is now out of intensive care and on the mend. And so we're very thankful to the Lord for that. So let's just take a moment and go into his presence. And uh, together, uh, how this works is I'm doing the praying, but you're watching and listening, and you are uniting your heart with mine and saying, yes, Lord, I agree with that. I want you to intervene for us. So let's just pray. Lord, we thank you that the scripture says that because of Jesus Christ, he grants us access into your presence. And the scripture to kind of help us says that because of that, we may come into your presence with confidence or boldness. So Lord, we come into your presence today and first of all, thank you for the way that you've been protecting our church family and protecting this country. The numbers have not gone near as high as they thought it might. Kind of reminds me of what that scripture verse says that the horse is prepared for battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. And we've been preparing the horse. We're social distancing. We're wearing our masks when we go out. And we believe that you've been doing the rest, protecting us, keeping that hedge up around this church and our church family. So first of all, we just give you thanks for that. Lord, we pray now too for our leaders uh, as now they're trying to figure out how do we start this back up? What do we do for the economy? When do we release this shelter in place? And even when we do, what kind of rules might there be? And so, Father, that is a tremendous weight on the shoulders of all of those that lead us. And so we pray that you might grant them wisdom so that they might know the right decisions to make uh, in order to continue to protect us. We love this country, Lord. We love the freedoms that we have. We're so thankful for the men and the women that, I mean, through countless generations have given their lives so that we could have and enjoy these freedoms which allow us to stand up here and say that we believe Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God and that salvation is found in him and him alone what a tremendous privilege that is and so we pray for those that have granted us those freedoms we pray for our leaders right now and then Lord all these caregivers putting themselves on the front lines, trying to save those that are struggling. Thank you for the choice that they made in their careers and their dedication to it. We thank you for Marty's niece that was in intensive care and now she's on the mend. Pray that you might continue to watch over and protect her. And then we pray for Lance's brother, Larry, who is on the kind of the downswing of this virus. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll give the doctors wisdom and that you will bring him back to full strength also. Lord, we just pray for outreach. We thank you for these live streams that we do, and we just pray that you might use them in mighty ways, and that people that are listening will understand what the Word of God has to say, that it might touch their lives and help them to live more fully for you. Lord, we ask that you might keep, continue to keep this hedge around our church family. And that, Lord, when the time is right for us to get back together again, that you give us as leaders here the wisdom to know when should we open these services back up, what should they look like. These are uncharted waters for all of us, and I'm so thankful that the Scripture says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously. We are, we are a poor people when it comes to wisdom. And so, Lord, as we move ahead, we ask that you might, in fact, give us that wisdom to know what to do and how to do it. We love our church family. We love serving together, and we want to make sure that we make the right choices uh, to protect everyone, but at the same time, know when it's right for us to get back together. We need the fellowship that the scripture says is so important to us. It strengthens us. It encourages us. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. 
Continue to be with us now as we sing another song and look into the word, Lord. We leave these requests at your feet and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last Sunday was Easter Sunday, and um, the Doma Cathedral in Milan, Italy, invited Andrea Porcelli to come and perform a concert for them for Easter Sunday. Well, it was very strange. It was a beautiful concert, but there was no one there. Just him, the organist, and probably some talent and uh, lighting technicians, and that was it. And he sang many beautiful religious songs, all in Italian or Latin. But then when he came to the end, he exited the cathedral and went into the plaza, again, empty, this huge plaza, empty, just himself, and he sang Amazing Grace in English. And, but that's the real message of Easter that God reached down to us and presented salvation for us, gave his son for us. So let's sing four verses of Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. T'was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. In this last verse, there's a phrase in there, 10,000 years. And I always thought it was interesting because by that author's perspective, that was a really big number, 10,000. But we think, you know, we now look at computers and we have megabytes gigabytes, terabytes, and you talk about the government, and now they're talking about trillions of dollars in debt. So that number, 10,000, is so minuscule now. And it doesn't matter what that number is. No matter what it is, it is small compared to eternity. And that God's love for us, and that it will never fail. It will not end. So let's sing that last verse. <clears throat> When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, sound video team. Well, if you'd like to turn ahead, Matthew 27 is the place for our first scripture reference. As I do each week, I encourage you to open up your Bibles and look at these scriptural passages with me. Um, we do that here in our church. I've told you before, we don't put the verses up on the screen. And the reason that we don't is because we want you to be able to look along with us and see what the Word of God has to say. So ask that you might do that with us today. So last week, uh, we were obviously continuing uh, our look at things that will bring us hope. 
and we looked at what was involved on Easter itself. And as I was reading the passage, I realized that surrounding every event of that day are glimpses of God's power. So that's what we did. We looked at things and we realized that those little glimpses could, in fact, bring us hope. Try to imagine what it was like when those disciples went there that day and the tomb was empty. Jesus was alive and what that, man, what that meant to them, what that would have done for them, how their countenance would have changed from what was experienced on Friday to what happened to them on Sunday. And as those events kind of began to roll along and Jesus was alive and walking, how encouraging that would have been for all of his followers. One thing that we emphasized last week is this reminder that this power that God has, the power that he displayed, in fact, has no limits. Let's look at this one again. This is Matthew chapter 27. Uh, you'll, if you come back every Easter and every Good Friday, I'm going to always refer to this passage because I just think it's so, uh, so thrilling. So verse 50 says, when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Now, the reason I'm reading this is because you might be experiencing some trouble and what happens is Satan tries to tell you that there's no hope. These glimpses of power are designed to erase that lie and to give you hope. See, the power of God, the power that Jesus possesses has no limits. And here's one of those little glimpses of it because after Jesus cried out in a loud voice, he gives up his spirit at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. There's an earthquake. The earth shook. Rocks split in half. And then here, the tombs broke open. And the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Man, talk about a power that has no limits. How exciting that must have been uh, uh, for people to see as the door knocks and the door flies open and a loved one who had passed is standing right there. Those folks understood at that moment that the power that God possesses has no limits. And we wanted to encourage you with the same thing. Now, again, the reason that this is so important today is there's a lot of stuff that's going on. We're at this point juncture where we have to shelter in place and you're afraid to go outside and you've probably experienced this no matter where I walk no matter where I go people are man they they're very afraid of this virus and so they kind of move off to the side I went out for a hike yesterday and of course uh, this little park that I go to I like going there because usually during the week I'm the only one there but nobody's working so the place was really packed yesterday and man as you're walking down the trails People literally, I mean, the, the path itself is at least 10 foot wide. And people are so afraid that as I'm walking up, they're walking off the path into the weeds. My friends, listen, this virus is bad, but it cannot jump and then follow you and attack you. But we're so worried about things. And so the shelter in place has us nervous. And how about the economy? Uh, it's in a free fall. And so many people are being affected by it. And you've heard the stories of people that are unable to even get through uh, to be able to get their unemployment benefits. People that have small businesses. This big stimulus package was passed and it was supposed to help those folks. And as you've heard, that money's gone. And now the politicians are fighting between themselves about to get more. And at the same time, there are people that may literally be on the brink of losing their businesses. So what do you do in the midst of all of that trouble? I mean, this is a wave that's just almost overwhelming. That's why we're looking at these glimpses of power. Christ dies on the cross and dead people come back to life. If this God that we're talking about has the power to raise the dead back to life, he can help you overcome whatever it is that you're facing, whether it's the nerves that are frayed by the virus and the shelter in place, can help you overcome whatever this economic struggle it is that you're going through. I'm not saying that God is going to solve all your problems and miraculously give you a winning lottery ticket. But the scripture says that God won't leave you 
He won't forsake you. He will guide you and can give you a peace in the midst of all of this. So whatever you're facing, know that God can help you overcome it all. So we started looking at these glimpses. Last couple weeks, we've looked at glimpses one through uh, seven, I think. And today is going to be glimpses eight and nine. And tonight, man, you got to come back tonight because glimpse number 10, <laughs> it's my favorite out of all these glimpses of power. Probably everyone has their own, but you got to come back tonight and be encouraged as we look at that last glimpse of God's power because every one of them is designed, I think, to bring you hope in the midst of it. That's what we're going to do today. Just a few more glimpses at God's power. And as Steve has reminded you, at the end, we're going to make our way over to the communion table. And so uh, I hope that you've been prepared for that. We've never done this before in a live stream, uh, but nothing should change. The whole point of the communion table is to remind you of what we're talking about, God's power and what that power accomplished for us. So that's how we'll end up the service and encourage you to be a part of it. Before we dig deeper into the word, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for, well, for each occasion that we have to look into the word, and especially the last couple of weeks, because these glimpses that we have of your power cannot help but bring us hope. I mean, if you can raise the dead back to life, you can help us in whatever trial, whatever moment of trouble that we're going through. Lord, I realize that there are people that are watching this today whose hearts are perhaps broken. Maybe they're out of work. They don't know how they're going to pay their rent. They don't know how they're going to pay their car payment. And those worries are real. Every person in this church, every person that's here today has been there at one point or another. What am I going to do? Lord, remind them today of your power. Begin to give them that peace that passes understanding. I pray that even in the midst of this service that you will kind of bathe them in your love, your power, your peace. Just keep reminding them of your promises. And so, Lord, we just uh, ask in a special way that the people that are watching this might receive those truths, those promises that, that we all need today. Help us now as we look at these glimpses of your power. Pray that they might encourage us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 9. Hey, Howard, I don't know if it's possible, but my screen back there is not working. Okay. So, obviously... Like you, man, I love all the stories of God's power. And I especially love every time that that power is displayed through miracles. You read through these New Testament books and you get excited as you think about all of these moments where his power is displayed. Let's look at one of them together. This is Matthew chapter 9. I love this one, beginning in verse 20. Uh, another reminder that God has the ability to do anything. In this particular one, Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 20. There was a woman who had been very sick. It doesn't really tell us exactly what it is. She's been subject to some bleeding. She'd gone to the doctors of the day. They really couldn't do anything to help her, and she was desperate. We understand that. We've all been desperate at one point or another. All of us have gone through serious moments of, of crisis where you just don't know what to do. That's where this woman was at. So verse 20, it says, A woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up from behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. Because she said to herself, If I can only touch the cloak, I'll be healed. Jesus turned and saw her and said, Take heart, daughter. He says, Your faith has healed you. And from that moment, the woman was healed. And that is, it is amazing that the power of God just through a touch, the faith that she had that, that she would be healed and then she got it. And so those are glimpses of his power. But today is a little bit different. Today I want you to understand that not 
every glimpse of God's power involves healing. God has power outside of that, a power that affects us in a personal way. What do I mean by that? Turn with me now to, where are we going next? John chapter 20. We'll get glimpse number eight. And as I mentioned, it's a little bit different than what we've been looking at. I mean, it's great to talk about these big moments of power. I'll often talk about how sometimes we're in such a deep crisis that we need a Red Sea-style miracle. You've read that. Where there's the whole nation of Israel in front of this giant sea and their enemies are coming behind them. And what are we going to do? God literally parts the waters, dries the ground, and they walk across on dry ground. I'm always trying to imagine what that was like. Were the, were the fish just looking at him because I'm sure God held them in place? And they walked on dry ground and then they come back in and crush their enemies. Red Sea style miracles. You look at that and you cannot help but say, boy, I want to give God the glory. But there are other things that he does that are just as miraculous that should put us just as much in awe as we are with the Red Sea kind of miracles. That's what glimpse number eight is about. I think one of the most special things about God, and it's a power that he has, and we're going to call this one the power of God patience. Let's read the passage itself. This is John chapter 20, beginning in verse 19. As you know, this is after Christ has been raised from the dead. He's been making appearances to his disciples and to other people, so the word is spreading that Jesus is alive. But one of his disciples, his name was Thomas. And it's in this passage where Thomas gets his nickname that is still stuck with till today. Thomas had heard that Jesus was raised from the dead, but Thomas says, listen, I don't believe it yet. So let's read the passage and see what it says, beginning in John chapter 20. We're going to begin in verse 19, and we're going to make our way all the way down to verse 28, because it's going to set the stage where Thomas gets his nickname, Doubting Thomas. But in it, you will see that even though he doubts, our Savior has Ultimate patience. On the evening of the first day of the week, verse 19 of John chapter 20, when the disciples were together for fear of the Jews, Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be still. After he said that, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, Peace be with you. Boy, do we need that today. And as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. What's that all about? Come back tonight, we'll tell you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive his sins, they'll be forgiven. If you don't, they won't be. And now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And this other said, Listen, we've seen the Lord. But he said, Listen, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, week passes. Disciples were at the house again. This time, Thomas was with them. Once again, the doors were locked. Poof! Jesus come in and stands among them, and once again says, Peace be still. And he looks at Thomas, the one who doubted. And of course, God knows everything, what he said, what he feels. Here we see his patience because he comes into it and says, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believing. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Wow. Here is the risen Savior understanding the doubt that we can go through and has this loving patience over Thomas. We understand the value of patience. We've all experienced it at one point or another. As I'm getting older, of course, many of my childhood memories are fading. Sometimes somebody in my family will say something and I'm like, ah, I don't even remember it. 
but I can still remember the day when my dad decided he's going to teach me how to ride that two-wheel bike without the training wheels. You probably have that same memory. And I still remember, you know how the parents do it. They've kind of got the back of the seat, and they, they try to get you going a little bit. And when they think you've got it, they take their hands off, and the first couple of times, it's into the grass, and it's into the bushes. <laughs> and you're getting back up, and you're waiting. Maybe my parents are going to be mad at me. And my dad just kept picking that bike back up, and we'd make it a little bit farther. And then I could make it to one house, and then maybe a second house before I spun off into the grass. Now, we lived in the city, of course, and we had city blocks. And as a kid, my goal was to be able to not only make it to the corner, but make the turn around the corner. And I eventually wanted to be so cool I could go around the block. You remember that if you lived in the city? I was old enough now that my parents told me I could walk around the block. And now I wanted to ride around the block. So I kept getting up, and my dad kept grabbing the back of that seat. And I remember when I finally started to get it, I thought my dad was going to leave me, but he was running behind me the whole time with his hand right behind that seat, just in case I fell over. Through the ups and the downs, he had the patience with me. And I remember as we got near the corner, and then I knew I had it. And I started pedaling a little bit faster. And I don't really remember when my dad gave up, but somewhere along the line, he said, enough. And I got to that corner, and I made the turn. Woohoo! I could go around the block. Patience is a precious, precious thing. We understand that in our world, and think about how much more powerful it is when we look at it from God's perspective. This Savior that we're talking about, my friends, has patience on you and me, and we should shout to God, be the glory. Let's go back to the Old Testament, Psalm 103. You know that this is my favorite of the Psalms. And in it, Psalm 103, it gives us once again glimpses of what this patience looks like. Psalm 103, this should be on your to-do list. Hopefully also you're memorizing Psalm 91. We're going to go over that on Wednesday. But Psalm 103, powerful passage. But let's go to verse 8, and we get this glimpse of his patience with us. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. <laughs> Slow to anger, patient, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. And everybody watching shouts, amen. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed his transgressions from us. As a father has compassion and patience on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Why does he have such patience? Verse 14 says, For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are but dust. Wow. My friends... As wonderful it is, as it is to read about his miracles and the people that are healed, this is a glimpse of his power that affects us every day. He has patience with us. Because why? He loves us and has compassion on us. If you're watching this today and you're struggling, take heart. This God that we're talking about has patience with us. One more glimpse for today. Back to John chapter 21. I love this one too. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 7. So there's all these moments where God is, Jesus is revealing himself to his followers after the resurrection. This is my favorite. Because in this passage, it shows us very clearly that God cares. And when you care about someone, you want to do something for them to meet a particular need that they might have. That's what 
caring is all about. We've been seeing glimpses of that today. One of the things that I've been telling you is that you need to remind yourself that there are good things going on in the world. I posted a video a couple weeks back about five things that you can do to not give in to this virus panic. And one of the suggestions is turn off the news and find stories of good news. So I saw one last night. There was a lady. She had been preparing to run her first marathon. Been working on it for more than six months and was supposed to do the marathon in the midst of this shelter in place. Do you know what that means? All of that stuff has been canceled. And how discouraging that can be that you've prepared for something and then all of a sudden it's done. Well, she has a fiancé who had been watching her train and he cares about her. And so he puts together this plan and he maps out in the city that they live in where could she go to complete the 26-mile race. And then he calls all of her friends and tells her, tells them, listen, I'm going to have her run the marathon and I want you to encourage her, but of course with social distancing in mind. And so he maps it out for her. She begins to run this marathon and every couple parts of the journey there's one of her friends in a car and they got the window rolled down and they got signs out saying you know you can do it go 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 and as she makes it towards the end he had literally built two uh, boards together with a little piece of paper in the middle you know how it is and she races through that and the paper breaks and all of her friends are in the car and they're all you know clapping and shouting watch and that's caring when we care for someone and we see a need that they have, we meet that need. In this particular passage, Jesus cares about his followers, and he's about to display it by something that he does. So John chapter 21, let's back up a little bit. Uh, let's go back to verse 4. John 21, verse 4. Early in the morning, Jesus is standing on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was him. They had been out fishing right off the shore. So he calls on, he says, hey, friends, do you have any fish? And they said, no. And he said, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loves, that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his garment around him and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat. Peter's a little bit, uh, uh, you know, he has a little hard time controlling himself. The other disciples followed, towing this net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 100 yards. Now here's where it gets good. When they had landed, they saw that there was a fire of burning coals. There was a ready fish on it. And then there was some bread. And I always picture that this is hot, fresh bread. You know the kind where you just put the butter on it, it just melts. What a moment. And then Jesus says, hey, you just got some more fish. Bring that. We're going to have a big, we're gonna have a big shindig here, a big breakfast together. Simon Peter climbed aboard, dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish, 153 of them, but so uh, many, but the net was not torn. And here's verse 12. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Here's this little glimpse that God cares and does something about it, makes them breakfast on the shore. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking at some point when we go into the, the splendor and the glory of heaven, he says he's prepared mansions and rooms for us. Do you think there's going to be that day when there's going to be a knock at the door and Jesus is coming by making breakfast for us? I think it's possible. But my friends, whatever you're going through today, this is a reminder that Jesus cares. And would love to do something about it for you. There's a number of places that give us this. Let's just look at one. Mark chapter 6 and verse 30. This is when ministry is going on for the disciples. And they had been going out and about. And they were preaching and teaching and healing the sick. And in Mark chapter 6 and verse 30, they get back from this says, verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus. They reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance 
to eat. Here's what Jesus says. And once again, another glimpse of this power of caring. He says to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus makes them breakfast after the resurrection. And even during their time of ministry, you could see that he cared about his followers. How special is that, that this God that we're talking about knows whatever it is that you need right now and cares enough to want to do something about it. Now, what's the greatest display of his caring? Two verses that will lead us right to the communion table. Let's go first to Ephesians chapter 5. How do we know? That he cares. Okay, Pastor, you gave us these little glimpses. He wanted to make sure that the disciples got some rest and he made them some breakfast. But Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2 is another reminder of that caring. You see, my friends, we were in trouble. The scripture says that the wages of sin is death and we're all sinners. Man, we're in trouble. Will somebody care enough to do something about that? The wages of sin is death. And here in verse 2 it says, Live a life of love just as Christ loved us. And he's going to do something about it. Gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. See, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Want an, want an illustration of caring? We were in trouble. We couldn't make our way into heaven. And he gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering to God. One last one. 1 John chapter 4. So the scripture makes it clear we were in trouble. What were we going to do about it? Well, his caring was displayed through his sacrifice. Verse 9, and we'll go into verse 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. How much does God care? He cared enough that Jesus died on a cross so that our sins could be forgiven. So what's the question of the day? How do we celebrate that? How do we remember that? Well, we do it through a thing that we call communion. Communion is a, a time where we just stop and we remember what it was that Jesus did. His display of caring. I'm going to close up in a word of prayer and make our way over to the communion table. We'll talk a little bit more about what this sacrifice did, what it did for me, and what it could do for you. But let's just close up this time in prayer. You get your things ready, and we're going to celebrate communion together. But right now, Lord, thank you so much for these glimpses of power. You have patience with us. Thank you so much for that. And then not only is this glimpse of patience, but the glimpse of caring. You wanted the disciples to get rest when they needed it. You cooked them breakfast on the side of the shore. And of course, the ultimate display of caring is that Jesus gave himself as an atoning sacrifice for us. Lord, please comfort people with those truths today and remind them that God cares for them. Thank you, Lord, for that today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever we approach the communion table, I refer to a passage in 1 Corinthians. This is where Paul was writing and telling us about this event that we celebrate. If you know the backstory to it, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, there was this event that we now call the Last Supper. 
And Jesus, to remind his disciples about what he was going to do, he broke bread. He drank from a cup. They had bread and wine. We used crackers and grape juice. It was symbolic at the Last Supper, and it's symbolic now. And so this is an event that we do that reminds us about what it was that Jesus did And as we celebrate, of course, it reminds us of the things that we've been talking about. His love, his caring for us. But as we come to it, Paul wrote about it, and he says this in verse 28. Before we do this, a person should examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. What's the examination all about? The first part is, do you know this Jesus that we're talking about? I hinted at a verse a few moments ago. The scripture says that the wages of sin is death. Earlier in that book, it says that all of us have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And so Romans 6, 23 says, that's a problem. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We receive that gift when we understand we can't get into heaven on our own. And so we, we realize that our sin is holding us. We repent, we turn from our sins, and we receive that free gift that he accomplished. Remember, I just read it, as an atoning sacrifice. He shed his blood for us. And so we receive that gift. We ask Christ to come into our hearts to cleanse us from all of our sin and to take up residence inside. It's at that moment we become born again. If you've received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you're welcome to participate with us. If you're watching this and this is the first time you understood that your sins is going to cause you to fall short of the glory of God right now, at this moment, all you have to do is turn from your sins and say, Lord, I want that that gift of salvation. I understand today for the first time that Christ was my atoning sacrifice, paid the price for our sins. I want you to come into my heart and into my life. The second part of the examination is for us that are believers. I always say as we come before him, it's always a good time to kind of evaluate and look and say, I need to tweak some things. You know, with all this time that we have on our hands, a good question to ask ourselves is, what place does God have in my life? Jesus himself said that we're to seek first the kingdom of God. And when this time of trouble is released and we're back to freedom, boy, I hope that you use that freedom to serve God fully. So Heidi's going to begin to play, and I'm going to give you just a few moments to look inside. Maybe God has been giving you peace that passes understanding. This would be a great time for you to just thank him for all that he's done. Maybe he's been protecting your family and say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for that hedge of protection. Maybe this is the first time that you've realized that your sins are going to cause you to fall short of God. Today is the day that you understood that he was your atoning sacrifice. Then ask him to come into your life right now. We'll give you a few moments to just talk with him And then I'll close us up with prayer. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. Thank you for this moment to remember what Jesus did. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. In this passage in 1 Corinthians, there are two parts to it, just like there was on the night of the Last Supper. And, of course, Jesus had this bread that he was about to break, And he said to them that this bread was symbolic of his body. For us, of course, we don't have to take the time to pass it out. So just take that bread and be ready. Because it says in here that he took the bread and then he gave thanks. I'm just going to give thanks to God for what he went through 
for us, and then we'll participate together. Lord, there's so much in that story that reminds us about the agony that you went through. Whether it was the mockings that you endured or the beatings, not only to the body, but the beatings on the head, the crown of thorns, how they spat upon you, this piece of bread is symbolic of all that you went through. Even though the scripture says you could have called out and legions of angels would have come to protect you. Lord, you did that all for us. And so, Lord, we're so thankful for that. Paul, writing about it, said this, that after he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Of course, the disciples didn't understand that night why there were two parts of this I call a celebration. The second part was the wine. For us, it's the grape juice, and it was symbolic of the blood that was about to be shed. You've seen some of the verses today that talk about it, that he's the atoning sacrifice. Scripture says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, and so Jesus did those things and shed that blood for us. So before we celebrate with the cup, we'll ask Mr. Roberts to give thanks. Dear Lord, we uh, thank you as we saw in Ephesians, the first one, we saw that your blood was a sacrifice. We thank you more that you just didn't give yourself as a good person, but you know, you as the Father rose him from the dead to show that you accepted that. And we mm-hmm. thank you for that, Lord, for the redemption you brought to us. So take your cups, and I'll finish reading what Paul said. It says this, In the same way, after supper, Christ took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. My friends, if you're discouraged today, there's one other verse in this passage I want to read. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The day is coming when we're not going to do this anymore because we're going to be in his presence and to give him thanks for his sacrifice for all eternity. I'm going to close up with a word of prayer. I encourage you to re-watch this sermon. If you have questions, come back tonight as we look at glimpse number 10. If you've been struggling with how to serve him and if you should serve him, come back tonight for glimpse number 10 and you will be encouraged. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to just give thanks to you. Every time that we are able to pause and reflect and celebrate what you've done, we pray that it might encourage the hearts of all those that are watching today. Until we meet again, bring us back tonight, Lord. Continue to keep this hedge around us our church families, and those that we love. We leave ourselves in your care and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you tonight. See you tonight, Mr. Roberts.